Um, so, uh, right, so I'm super excited about this. So uh, we have uh, Ziad Obermeyer from um, Berkeley, from UC Berkeley. He absconded from Boston, but um, we'll forgive him for that. Uh, and so, so again, like I, I do hope that everybody had the chance to, um, to watch the talk. It's a really, it's a really amazing talk. And um, it, it's rough, or largely about problems and labels. And um, the, the sort of, more specifically, I guess, the labels that we as machine learners use and the harm and benefits that they might induce. And so I guess maybe what we could do is you could start with, I guess, summarizing that you talked about kind of two examples, I guess, and maybe you could summarize just the first of these to begin with, um, in which a, a sort of a use of a bad proxy ended up propagating racial bias. Yeah, th thanks, Byron. And so, yeah, so I, I tried to, um, I once was told that good presentations have a story, uh, like, and characters. And so the first character is like the evil character. Um, and, and this character is an algorithm that was designed to do something that actually is a, is a great thing that we want our healthcare system to be doing. We want it to be anticipating who's going to get sick. And so we want it to be looking ahead and seeing like who's on the edge, who do I need to intervene on now and get some extra help with their, with their chronic illnesses. Um, the, the problem and the reason, I, I guess like many characters, um, you know, uh, in, in Greek um, legends, you know, they're fundamentally a good character, but they're, they're converted to evil by one fatal flaw. And the one fatal flaw in this case is that um, the way that the algorithm developers, in this case and in many other cases in lots of other algorithms, conceptualize who's going to need healthcare is who's going to cost our healthcare system a lot of money. And that's the fatal flaw because um, by using that healthcare cost as a proxy for healthcare needs, you are distorting what the algorithm is predicting. So that label, while reasonable, is both flawed and also uh, racially biased. So it's flawed because, you know, cost is a funny label. It puts together a bunch of weird things. Like at some point, people decided that procedures were going to cost more than someone talking to a patient. So cost builds in all of those weird distortions in how we price medical care. But more importantly, it also builds in distortions um, that poor people and non-white people have less access to medical care and so generate lower costs. Right, right. So th the algorithm deprioritizes those people. Right. Um, and, and now um, the second example that you gave, though, was a little bit more uh, optimistic, I guess, in, in the sense that I think um, the takeaway there, if I if I have it correct, is that kind of if you pick the right labels, um, they might actually reveal uh, biases that you perhaps didn't even know were um, were in place. And so you give this example, I guess, of uh, knee pain. And um, so it, it ostensibly, I guess, it seemed like patients with the same severity as assessed using the standard scale. Is that right? Um, basically, that 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 folks reading these uh, X-ray imaging uh, would typically use, and I've been trained to use, uh, tended to report differential amounts of pain across um, racial groups. And uh, yeah. in particular, I think it was, it was that black patients reported higher pain levels. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so in, in, you know, the, the good character, the good twin in the story is actually an algorithm that exposes bias in something that we use every day as doctors. So this is how we grade the severity of someone's knee osteoarthritis. And you know the way we grade that has been um, pretty stable since the 19, uh, I think 50s when the scaling system was first developed on an entirely white population of coal miners in England. Um, and, and one of the mysteries that we've learned since then is that black patients, but also um, uh, poorer patients, less educated patients report more pain even when their knee looks the same as a, you know, for example, a white patient's um, knee who's reporting less pain. And what the algorithm did was instead of learning how to just spit back out what the radiologist would say about that image, the algorithm was trained instead to predict the patient's experience of pain. And by doing that, it actually found features in the knee x-ray that were far more predictive of black patients' pain and so actually give an organic basis for some of the pain that I think a lot of people had been thinking was psychosomatic or related to stress or, or things outside of the knee. And like, um, 
this is perhaps a very silly question, but uh, is it possible that, um, like, I guess if you tried to predict, let's say, race from the knee image, would that be possible? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And so in the, the paper, which hopefully will be out uh, soon, and I should say this is all done, um, uh, there, there were a bunch of people playing supporting roles, including me, but this is all led by Emma Pearson, who's going to be a, uh, she just finished at Stanford, she's going to be at uh, Cornell Tech by way of MSR. Um, and, and so what Emma did um, was a number of robustness checks to, to make sure that the algorithm wasn't just learning that this person was less educated um, slash black slash poor. And so um, one, of the, one of the interesting things we did was just do that test and make sure that the algorithm was not literally reconstructing race. Um, mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, it's actually hard to reconstruct race from just an x-ray and it was not I, able I to do so, that. But, yeah. Yeah. but I'm not, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm not a real data no, it's a fantastic question, and um, and as my 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 parents would say, who are both uh, like you, um, or your kind of doctor, I'm the one who's not the real doctor. So uh, that that's how I grew up. That's good. That's good. And you know, um, okay, great. And we we actually have a, a an interesting question coming in from um, from the audience as well. Um, so the the question is basically, have you tried stratifying this by let's say gender instead of uh, race? Yeah. So you know. Uh, Gender turns out like the um, the phenomenon that we were most interested in was um, you know what you can think of as the pain gap. In other words, conditional on the severity of the image as assessed by traditional measures of severity, um, uh, are people reporting more pain than you'd expect? And that turns out to be a finding that's much more pronounced when you look at um, race, education, and income than when you look at sex. Um, and so uh, in, for, for this task in particular, it just turns out that sex is not one of the axes on which you get differential pain conditional on the x-ray image. Okay, very interesting, yeah. Um, very cool, yeah. So I guess another question that I had when, I guess a sort of a high level question related to the general theme of sort of labels is, um, I guess to what extent do you think the bias that you've observed at least in these settings is really a function kind of I guess exclusively an outcome of labels versus um, is it possible that somehow they're like even just using certain let's say model variants uh, could impose biases even if the labels are um, uh, let's let's for want of a better term let's call them unbiased whatever that might mean um, like do you think that there's still a risk even then um, just inherent to certain model classes let's say. Yeah, absolutely. And I, well, um, I'll step back and, and just say address what maybe the bigger question that um, that you're bringing up, which is that, you know, uh, a lot of my work, I, I'm particularly interested in, in labels, and, and I'm intrinsically interested in them. And I'm intrins interested in them as a mechanism by which bias gets into algorithms. Sure. But there are many, many other mechanisms by which bias gets into algorithms. And actually, one that I'll just mention uh, in the setting of this knee x-ray paper is that if we were to retrain the algorithm only on white patients, it would no longer do as well in explaining the pain that is experienced by black patients. Mm -hmm. And so this, of course, plugs into a big literature on the diversity of the um, training set as a mechanism by which bias can get in. And so, and so that I think is a is a perfect example of you know if you consider pain to be an, an unbiased label, and there are many reasons why you might not, but let's just bracket that. If you don't have diversity in your training set, you will still introduce bias, and you will not be able to do as well. Um, so yeah, so I, I think there are, there are a lot. All of the literature on how bias gets into algorithms, I think, applies. I think what we're trying to do is is um, draw attention to this somewhat new mechanism that's different from a lot of those that are in the literature today. Nice. Yeah, and coming back to the knee pain example, we have a, an audience question, um, which I was curious about as well which is, you know, so, okay, so I guess you found that by using um, a model, you're able to kind of uh, explain more, I guess, of the disparity gap between, uh, let's say, black patients and white patients. And I guess, but the, the next question that we might have is, are you able to use that model to actually pick out what might have been being, what might have, what, what humans were missing? What, uh, you know, why weren't we picking up on this? Yeah, I, I mean, this um, we we finished uh, we finished this paper right um, uh, BC before COVID, and and we actually were um, just starting to think through 
how we do that. And so I think, you know, I, I would actually, if anyone has um, ideas on, on how to do that, we would love to hear them. Here's a couple of thoughts on, on, on how we were thinking about that task is, is actually just trying to um, find some doctors who have a lot of experience reading knee x-rays and essentially just present them with pairs of images. Mm -hmm. um, conditional, you know, so, so essentially holding constant the official grade. So, you know, according to the standard system, these two x-rays should have the same severity, but one of them, the algorithm says, no, this person's gonna have a lot more pain and one um, less, and just asking them in an open-ended way, what's different about these two images. So trying to use yeah. the human as a, as a classifier for the algorithm um, in, a, in a funny way and invert the process. But um, yeah, so that was, that was kind of where we were starting to head with it and then, you know, nobody has bandwidth to do anything in the health system um, besides COVID these days, as I'm sure um, many yeah, of our that, listeners that, that know. That sounds like a really fast, I look forward to seeing that. I think that's a, a fascinating uh, question. Uh, so we have, we have a, a question actually that um, relates to the preceding talk, which is uh, given your work and your perspective on um, the, the, I guess, potential dangers and potential benefits of labels. Um, do, what, do you have any recommendations in terms of sort of robustness checks that um, developers of machine learning models f might perform sort of prior to deployment? Um, and, and, or like, do you have kind of patterns that you might follow and that you might advise others to? Yeah, so th this is this has actually come up a lot. You know, we, um, we were lucky to get a lot of uh, publicity and attention from that initial study. And what we tried to do is turn that into a set of collaborations with health systems, with algorithm developers, with uh, payers, and, and in some cases with um, federal and state regulators to essentially try to come up with some kind of playbook um, that, that's a structured way to approach that exact question. I think one of the challenges, one of the things that makes this hard is that it's very hard to automate those checks. And so in our example, had you run a series of, you know, what, what you could imagine is very simple, automatic checks on calibration on you know whatever your preferred measure of bias is you would likely have found no bias because for the task as stated cost prediction the algorithm was doing a really good job and it was doing a pretty unbiased job it was a good algorithm for the question we asked it now the problem is that that wasn't the real question um, and so you know what makes this hard and, and what makes it hard to kind of you know come up with a you know, we can't we can't build that into a Jupyter notebook and give it to people. Sure. The, the first step is asking, okay, what is the true goal of the algorithm? What is the what is the quantity? Even if it's a latent variable that is truly unmeasured that I'm trying to measure, and what is the variable that I'm actually measuring? And then thinking about the delta between those two things, how that delta varies with race and socioeconomics and all the other things that we care about. That's, I think, maybe the core of the approach. Um, and what becomes clear is, you know, if you go through that exercise, you'll often find that there's, um, you know, we're we're predicting a variable, but we're using that as a proxy for a tr for a heterogeneous treatment effect, or we're actually conflating two things. And so, you know, yeah. one common example in health systems is like, oh, predicting no shows, so people who book an appointment and who don't show up for the appointment. And if you ask you know, people, they'll say, no, we're really, that's exactly what we're interested in predicting, no-shows. So it actually turns out that they're interested in two types of no-shows. One is the kind that you can ignore because someone had a cold, the cold got better, and they didn't show up to their appointment. The other no-show is a diabetic who doesn't have transportation, but really needs to get to that appointment. And so, the, so starting that process of structuring the, even if I don't know, you know, the, the latent variable that, that it's the true quantity of interest, what is that and how does it differ from the proxies that I have in my data set? It reminds me a bit of um, in, in trials, right? There, there's this notion of having sometimes the wrong endpoint that, that you know, it, people exactly. take, you know, like they'll take it as a, some sort of, you, what you really care about maybe is mortality, but this is, takes for a very long time to measure and it's, comparatively rare or whatever. So you use these convenience metrics like, you know, tumor size or something like that. I, I don't know. But, um, you know, I think there's, I see sort of connections there that, that I hadn't thought about before in an ML context. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. I think in, in, in clinical trials, there's this huge debate and literature on these surrogate outcomes 
Um, and I think you see, I mean, this is this is not at all a problem restricted to algorithms. Um, we, we actually have a paper that just came out this morning in JAMA on how COVID funding, um, relief funding is being allocated. So this is $175 billion of relief funding to hospitals. And how are they allocating that funding? Well, proportional to the hospital's prior revenue. Um, and that's in some cases reasonable yeah. because you, uh, you know, you got, got to get the money out the door quickly and big hospitals need more help and they suffer more financial losses, but it induces the exact same kinds of biases um, as the algorithm that we studied. And so in policy and clinical trials and in algorithms, we, we face the same fundamental problem of how do we measure the real thing that we care about. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I have two questions from the audience that are, I'm going to try to combine. I think they're related at least in spirit. So one is about sort of um, how do you address, I guess, your own as, as the modeler or as the person asking the questions? Um, how do you address kind of your own biases, right? Like, so you pick these specific kind of um, demographic characteristics or what have you that, that you choose to, um, you know, investigate, I suppose. And, and that perhaps that has its own bias in what you select to look at. And a related question um, that somebody asks is um, basically were, were there any, um, I, I guess, uh, diverse members on the team, right? Or, uh, and I guess th these are questions that are sort of are complementary. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, th there is a, a sense in, in this idea that, you know, when you have diverse perspectives on a team, you are gonna be much more attuned to these issues. And, and I think that that's, I, I just couldn't agree more with that. And I think everything that we know about um, how opinions in a group get elicited and reinforced or discarded supports that. There's a lot of research to suggest that, you know, you really, really need a diverse team to actually come up with these ideas. Um, at the same time, I think that that um, I don't think that's an I don't think that's radical enough, um, and so I think that that needs to be combined with a lot of um, additional I'd say training and attention to these issues. And so, you know, like the, it's hard to overstate the scale that these biased algorithms were operating at in our healthcare system. So they were being made not just by one company, not just by companies, by academic groups. They were being purchased by hospitals. Um, you know, the, the people who were making and consuming these algorithms included many people of color, um, many people with deep commitments to diversity and to population health and equity. And, and that was not enough to make this connection um, and to prevent these algorithms from getting to the scale they got to. So I, I could not be more supportive of the idea that we, we need very diverse teams. We need to build a pipeline to make sure that we are getting diverse people into the pipeline. But I, I actually, I think that that needs to be combined with um, more awareness of, you know, this long literature in social science and anthropology in, you know, in many, many disciplines about how people access care, trust between patients and providers. Like, there, there is no substitute for that deep investment in the knowledge, both on the algorithm side and the social science side and the, and the clinical content side. Um, that, that I think you know has come up a lot in this um, in this conference already. Yeah, no, that's a that's a makes makes sense. Um, so we we also have a comment which uh, I agree with. Uh, I think that is basically uh, talking about how these this label problem, for example, it's kind of a result of I don't know just sort of historical accident in some ways. Um, I mean, the fact that th this, the pains, the, sorry, the way to assess the images was was done the way it was. Um, in this particular case, maybe it's not likely to meet a lot of resistance, but for many cases, the concern, like changing that, I mean, I, I don't know if that's true, but I can imagine that's true. And I guess in many cases, there will be a, a fair amount of kind of structural resistance to um, changing the way that we sort of think about these things. And I, I guess, like maybe at a high level, to what extent are these um, technical questions versus, I, I guess, really more sociological questions about the sort of way that we practice medicine? Yeah, it's, I mean, I don't think I'm at all qualified to answer this question. So we'll just say that um, this is an off the cuff opinion. I, I think that, um, you know, every field has resistance to change. Um, medicine, uh, despite I think what most people think about it, 
is a field where a paper can really change how people practice. You see this with randomized trials, like randomized trials overnight change the way thousands of doctors do their daily job. So it's actually a field that that does value evidence and 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 is able to be persuaded by evidence in a way that I think a lot of fields are not. You know, in a lot of um, other fields, there's no playbook for change like there is in medicine. So I, I'm optimistic, and I think the reason I'm particularly optimistic about these um, these label problems is because, and I'm not saying this is a general um, phenomenon, but at least in the cases that we've studied, there's really not a huge trade-off between efficiency and equity. So if you think about kind of um, what the algorithm was doing, the algorithm was that, that we studied that was biased by targeting extra resources to people who are going to be high cost rather than high need, not only was it being unfair to um, black patients, it was also economically inefficient in the sense that the resources were being targeted to people who already had resources rather than people who needed resources. Mm. Um, so I think in a lot of that, that's one nice thing about working in this label and proxy space is that by finding better measures, not only will you um, do you have the chance to increase equity, you're also doing something that's fundamentally economically efficient. And that's fundamentally sense. economically efficient in the sense of targeting. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's optimistic. So I guess we're, we're just about out of time. Well, I think we are actually out of time. But, um, let me end with one last question that we have, which is um, asking you to tell us more about Nightingale and how it relates to the global assistant of Nightingale. Yeah, so yeah, yes. the, the paper that we did on, on this knee pace phenomenon, phenomenon. It's, it's, it's not fair it's not that we were able to do this study just because I knew someone who had access to the data. And, and I think a lot of good research is being stymied just because we don't have um, a way for researchers to access data and ask a bunch of questions that need to be asked about bias, but just about medicine and, and, and algorithms in general. So uh, Nightingale is a, a nonprofit that, um, that I'm building uh, with a fantastic team of people um, that is trying to solve that problem. So we invest in helping health systems build up their own data resources internally so that they have better infrastructure. And in exchange, we get a de-identified version of a data set that's focused on images, waveforms, like these kind of high dimensional data that I think are, are for me the most exciting part of my work. Um, and we put those on a cloud and we make it incredibly secure, um, but also incredibly, um, or at least uh, as easy as we can for a researcher to, with one, you know, with one um, data use agreement, get access to data and start doing research. Um, and so we are uh, starting to um, move towards a launch next spring. And if you guys are interested in beta testing or, um, you know, or just learning more about it, please uh, email me or uh, the, the email address is, um, is on the slides from, from the talk. Great. I, I guess we had a, a few more minutes. I was, I, I suppose I was off in my timings. Um, so uh, th we do have uh, a few more. I haven't gotten to all of the audience questions. Hopefully they have opportunity to interact with you later at the, um, later during this conference. But um, there is, so I guess one question that's come in is, so there, there are many medical teams that interact with patient groups who might be able to relate their kind of lived experience. Um, and I guess the question is, are, do you think there are other ways to include their information? So um, in, in, in terms of sort of maybe the, that manifesting in better labels or better questions for the uh, caretakers, I guess, to ask. Yeah, I, I think that that phenomenon is one part of a larger and very positive trend in medicine, which is, you know, I think people call it by various names, but basically like the patient uh, reported outcomes um, is the, the um, the, the, the general term. And, and what this is, is basically health systems understand that the, the, the data that doctors are collecting, laboratory studies, x-rays, are not enough to accurately represent the, the lived experience of the patient. So they're starting to do outreach, uh, some of it in a very sophisticated way on apps, um, some of it, uh, as usual in medicine, on clipboards uh, and, and, you know, faxed forms. Uh, what are you going to do? Um, but, but whatever the, the mechanism, getting some of the data about um, function, pain, um, mood, all sorts of other um, psychological and psychiatric outcomes into the electronic health record so that we all have better labels to learn from that represent that experience. And I think that's a really uh, promising and, and positive trend. 
Great. Well, I appreciate the time. I think this has been, um, I, I think, a fascinating discussion. It was great to learn about the work. I'd like to thank both of our speakers for this for this afternoon. And um, uh, sorry, I couldn't get to all the questions. There are a lot of questions. Um, but I think now we're headed back to gather.town. So uh, I will see you all as tiny two-dimensional avatars. And um, and yeah, we'll 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 move on to the poster session and hopefully continue discussion there.